And good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's begin class with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, what a privilege to come again to study and to be in your presence. We ask that your spirit will join us. Give us wisdom, discernment, and help us to um, use the, the word of truth to demolish every argument and pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take our thoughts captive to you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. We're doing lesson number nine in the quarterly Psalms, and the title this week is Blessed is He Who Comes in the Name of the Lord. And we're going to start this week with Monday's lesson. And in the second paragraph in Monday's lesson, it reads the following. The torment of Christ's separation from his father caused by Christ carrying the entire world's sins can be measured only by the extent of their closeness, namely their unparalleled oneness. Yet even the depths of inexplicable suffering could not break the unity between the Father and the Son. In his utter forsakenness, Christ unconditionally entrusts himself to the Father despite the utter depth of despair he faced. And then the lesson goes on to quote the following from the book, The Desire of Ages, page 753. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. Now, I'm going to take two sentences from these paragraphs and I want to ask the question. Do these two sentences, one from the quarterly, one from the Desire of Ages, say the same exact thing? Or do they, on the surface, appear to be similar, but actually have a very important functionally distinct difference? Yes. Well, let's just read the two sentences. The torment of Christ's separation from his Father caused by Christ carrying the entire world's sins versus Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. Do those two things say the exact same thing or, or do they sound similar but they actually mean something quite different? Does one describe events through imposed law while the other is using the design law? What is interesting is that Ellen White, the author of the Desire of Ages, which the lesson quotes, advanced the message of the Adventist reformers at the General Conference of 1888 of the Great Controversy, uh, and they were opposed by the legalists at the, at the 1888 General Conference, and the legalists insisted that the Ten Commandments are eternal, while the reformers argued that the Ten Commandments were added because of human sinfulness and need by our gracious and merciful God. The reformers taught that design law and the salvation and that salvation is healing the sinner from sin while the legalist taught that sin is a legal problem and salvation is paying the legal penalty to God to get legally declared to be righteous while we remain unrighteous. Ellen White rejected the legalist view and advanced what we are teaching, but the church leadership like the Sanhedrin in Christ's day rejected the advancing truth and instead had promoted the legal lies of Satan <laughs> in which God is the source of inflicted death upon sinners as punishment for sin. So in the quote, the lesson from the lesson, the quote from the lesson, they have Christ carrying sins, as in bad deeds, behaviors, bad acts, crimes that need to be punished. He had to take the sins so he could pay the punishment. Ellen White has Christ taking our iniquity our sinfulness, the sin sickness with which we are born and which causes the symptoms known as sins. The legalists have Christ being externally punished for sin crimes of the people, while Owen White has Christ taking the infection of sinfulness in order to destroy it and take away the sinfulness, thereby curing or healing humanity. As John the Baptist said about Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, not the punishment of God for the sins of the world. This is a big distinction. So in the very next chapter in the book, Desire of Ages, that the lesson quotes from, 
And if you read it in larger context, you read into the next chapter, Ellen White makes it overwhelmingly clear that she taught design law and rejected penal substitution legal lies that has infected the church. And she describes how this conflict over God's law is at the root of the controversy and comes to a head before, before the coming of Christ. The Desire of Ages, the book, was written after the 1888 General Conference and was first published in 1898. And it describes the message that the Adventist reformers, of whom Ellen White was one, wanted the church to take this message to the world. But as you will see, as we unpack this entire chapter, it is quite different than the message being taught in our official materials, including the Adventist adult study guide. So let's examine the entire chapter. And I want you to ask for yourself, what law lens is the author of the book Desire of Ages writing through? And do you see that same view coming through in our more recent publications? So here we go. Christ did not yield up his life till he had accomplished the work he came to do. And with his parting breath, he exclaimed, it is finished. The battle had been won. The right hand, his right hand and his holy arm had gotten him the victory. As a conqueror, he planted his banner on the eternal heights. Was there not joy among the angels? All heaven triumphed in the Savior's victory. Satan was defeated and knew his kingdom was lost. Pause. But how was Satan defeated? What was necessary to defeat him? Was power used to punish the rebellious crimes and sins of Satan? If it was power used to win the victory, remember Jesus was given all power, John 8 in the upper room, all power was given to him. He had all power at his disposal. Does he use power here at the cross to win his victory? So what was Christ providing and achieving that, according to the author here, won the battle with Satan at the cross? The victory was achieved. Well, continuing on. To the angels in the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had deep significance. It was for them, as well as for us, the great work of redemption had been accomplished. They, with us, share the fruits of Christ's victory. Did the unfallen angels like Gabriel need a legal payment to pay for their sins? No. no, but did they need the cross? Yes. Doesn't Paul write in Colossians that all things in heaven and earth are reconciled to Christ at the cross? Yes, he, yes, he did write that. So, so what did the angels need that Christ provided at the cross if they didn't need a blood payment to an angry God to keep that God from killing them for their sin crimes? And do we need the same thing they needed? <clears throat> keep going. Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The arch apostate has so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had, had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. God's principles, not rules, principles, are the principles of truth, love, and freedom, and they were warring against Satan's principles of lies, fear, selfishness, and coercive force. The lie of imposed law, made up rules, power over, inflicted punishments, which are all part of Satan's kingdom and all the kingdoms of the world, fear and selfishness leads to dominance. The use of power to coerce, to make up rules, to inflict punishments. Satan's kingdoms, the kingdoms of this world. And no one, including God, get your mind around this. No one, including God, can get love, trust, loyalty, friendship, and devotion by threatening to inflict punishments on people who don't give you love, trust, loyalty, friendship, and devotion. You can't get that. That's design law. This author is making this very clear. Keep going. It was a being of wonderful power and glory that had set himself up against God. Oh, of Lucifer, the Lord says, thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Lucifer had been the covering cherub. He had stood in the light of God's presence. He had 
he had been the highest of all created beings and had been foremost in revealing God's purposes to the universe. After he sinned, his power to deceive was the more deceptive and the unveiling of his character was the more difficult because of the exalted position he had held with the father. Because Satan was in leadership, because Satan was esteemed, because Satan was loved, because Satan in his pre-fall state was looked up to and admired, because he was trusted. Then when he lied, his ability to deceive was all the more great and his lies were more difficult to expose. Why? Because lies cannot be refuted by simply declaring them to be lies. Evidence must be revealed to expose the lie and fully eradicate it from hearts and minds. Continuing on, notice again what comes next. Use of power, use of might. Look at the next quote and how God wouldn't do it. God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can pass a, cast a pebble to the earth. And by the way, that little description right there, that would be a description of design law. Gravity is a design law. Letting go of a pebble, it naturally falls to the earth. God could have naturally let Satan go from his life-sustaining presence and he would have died as quickly as a pebble falls to the earth. Okay, but God, God could do that, that simple. But he did not do this. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love. And the presenting of these principles, not rules, is the means to be used. God's government is moral and truth and love are the prevailing power. What are the prevailing power? Truth and love. Can one destroy lies with the use of power, might, and inflicted punishment? If someone is telling lies about you can, and people are believing them, can you get rid of those lies by killing the person who's telling lies? This is why the penal legal lies perpetuate the sin problem and obstruct the actual power of the gospel from healing hearts and minds. The teaching God will use his power to punish sin, sinners and destroy sin through the use of inflicted power and killing the sinners is a lie. God cannot destroy sin by the use of might and power. He can only destroy sin by the power of the gospel. Truth destroys lies. Love destroys selfishness and fear. So when the church teaches that God uses power to punish sinners, they have God acting the role of Satan and they obstruct the gospel. Again, note, this is the message of the Adventist reformers, what they wanted the church to take to the world. But this message has been replaced with, within our official publications with the penal legal lies of a punishing God. Continuing on, it was God's purpose to place things on an etern eternal basis of security. And in the councils of heaven, it was decided that time must be given for Satan to develop the principles which were the foundation of the, his system of government. He had claimed these were superior to God's principles. Time was given for the outworking of Satan's principles that they might be seen by the heavenly universe because eternal security means eliminating from hearts and minds of intelligent beings, the lies about God, the doubts, the fear, the selfishness, replacing that with truth, love, trust, loyalty. Simply destroying Satan and his angels while his lies are still believed would not restore love and trust in God. It would not eliminate the lies or stop the rebellion. In fact, to use power to destroy the one calling into question would only perpetuate more fear and distrust of God. Continuing on, Satan led men into sin and the plan of redemption was put into operation for 4,000 years. Christ was working for man's uplifting and Satan for the ruin and degradation. And the heavenly universe beheld us. This is the story of the Old Testament, the entire story of the Old Testament. Genesis 3.15, the promised Messiah, Jesus, the seed of the woman, is coming to crush the serpent's head. God, through the Old Testament, is constantly working to bring the Savior to redeem humans from sin, because without Jesus, no human can be saved. Satan is working to obstruct it, to stop it. He wants to harden every heart so no one will work with God. He wants to destroy the branch of the human family through whom Jesus would be born. And thus we see back and forth. God 
God working therapeutically to keep open the avenue for Messiah and Satan working to try and destroy that avenue for the Messiah. And we also see um, the, uh, how Satan seeks to corrupt God's plan by infecting the minds of people with the lie that God's law functions like human law. So they misinterpret and misconstrue God's loving acts of grace and therapeutic intervention as God being angry and punishing people for sin. When Jesus came into the world, Satan's power was turned against him. From the time when he appeared as a babe in Bethlehem, the usurper worked to bring about his destruction. In every possible way he sought, now notice what he sought to prevent. He sought to prevent Jesus from developing a perfect childhood, a faultless manhood, a holy ministry, and an unblemished sacrifice. But he was, un, he was defeated. He could not lead Jesus into sin. He could not discourage him or drive him from a work he had come on earth to do. From the desert to Calvary, the storm of Satan's wrath beat upon him. But the more mercilessly it fell, the more firmly did the Son of God cling to the hand of his Father and press on in the bloodstained path. All the efforts of Satan to oppress and overcome him only brought out in a pure light his spotless character. This is the first description in this chapter where the author, but it's not the last, where the author describes the objective nature of Christ's mission. Those who criticize us will lie and claim that we teach moral influence theory. The moral influence theory is the idea that Christ only had to reveal truth about how good God is in order to win us back to trust, to morally influence us to trust God. And it is true that, in fact, that's part of his mission. He had to reveal the truth to destroy lies and win us to trust, but, but that alone would not save the human species. The revelation of truth alone was enough for the loyal angels in their innocence to solidify them in their loyalty, but fallen sinful human beings needed something more than angels. We need it. And this is where she is beginning to describe, she'll unpack it a little bit more later in this chapter. We needed a sinless humanity, a new heart and right spirit, a humanity purified from sin. Jesus came not only to reveal the truth, but to purge the infection of sin from humanity and purify the species and offer, and offer us through faith a new life, a new heart, a right spirit of love instead of a fear, spirit of fear and selfishness. Thus this author describes how Jesus as a human had to develop this perfect humanity through the confrontation with the infection of sin and overcome it and eradicate it, thus destroying death and the cause of death. In Jesus, the living law of love and truth was lived out perfectly. When Satan attacked Jesus, Jesus loved, forgave, left others free. In his humanity, Jesus chose to live out the principles of God's design laws rather than the principles of survival the fittest. Okay, keep going. All heaven and the unfallen worlds have been witness to the controversy. With the intense, with intent, what intense interest did they follow the closing scenes of the conflict? They beheld the, the Savior enter the Garden of Gethsemane, his soul bowed down with horror of the great darkness, of a great darkness. They heard his bitter cry, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. As the Father's presence was withdrawn, they saw him sorrowful with a bitterness of sorrow exceeding that of the last great struggle with death. The bloody sweat was forced from his pores and fell in drops upon the ground. Thrice the prayer for the deliverance was wrung from his lips. Heaven could no longer endure the sight and a messenger of comfort was sent to the son of God. We are a theater, a spectacle to angels and to men. It says in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, angels long to look into these things. Jesus as our human substitute, taking up humanity damaged by Adam's sin, was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin, feeling the pull of his humanity that he took upon himself, the pull of fear, the anguish, the, the temptation to save self, to not go through the cross that our humanity tempted him with. He chose instead to love, to give his life freely. No one can take my life. I lay it down freely. And thus to purify the humanity with the perfect act and choice of love that 
and thus he rises again on the third day in a new humanity, a cleansed humanity. Continuing on, heaven beheld the victim betrayed into the hands of the murderous mob and with mockery and violence hurried from one tribunal to another. It heard the sneers of his persecutors because of his lowly birth. It heard the denial with cursing and swearing by one of his best loved disciples. It saw the frenzied work of Satan and his power over the hearts of men. Oh, fearful scene, the savior seized at midnight in Gethsemane, dragged to and fro from palace to judgment hall, arraigned twice before priests, twice before the Sanhedrin, twice before Pilate, and once before Herod, mocked, scourged, condemned, and led to be crucified, bearing the heavy burden of the cross amid the wailing of the daughters of Jerusalem, and the jeering of the rabble. Can you imagine Christ's humanity suffering, the fatigue, the pain, the physical, mental, and emotional anguish, the temptation to be angry, to be frustrated, the injustice of it all, the lies, the wrongness of it all. Jesus, yet, yet, in spite of all this, Jesus in his humanity loved. He had all power given to him, yet he did not use his power to punish sinners. He didn't use his power to restrict liberty, to stop the abuse, to punish the wrongdoers. He was showing the entire universe God's character of love, God's design laws of truth, love, and freedom, and how God wields power. And thus, in the book of Revelation, you see, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is he to have all power because he's shown us he will never abuse us with the power. He won't turn his power against us. Continuing on with the quote, heaven viewed with grief and amazement, Christ hanging upon the cross, blood flowing from his wounded temples and sweat, tin sweat tinged blood standing upon his brow. From his hands and feet, the blood fell drop by drop upon the rock drilled for the foot of the cross. The wounds made by nails gaped as the weight of his body dragged upon his hands. His labored breath grew quick and deep. His soul panted under the burden of the sins of the world. All heaven was filled with wonder when the prayer of Christ was offered in the midst of the terrible suffering. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yet, they, yet there stood men formed in the image of God, joining to crush out the, the life of his only begotten son. What a sight for the heavenly universe satanic agencies confederated with evil men to in leading the people to believe Christ the chief of sinners and to make him the object of detestation. Those who mocked Christ as he hung upon the cross were imbued with the spirit of the first great rebel. He filled them with vile and loathsome speeches. His, he inspired their taunts, but by all of this, he gained nothing. If we are not surrendered to Jesus Christ, if we do not have the Holy Spirit indwelling our spirit temples, our, our hearts, our minds, then we are aligning ourselves with the demonic. And the more we choose the demonic, the more closely we harmonize with our spirits, with the demonic, until we eventually are imbued with the spirit of Satan, the spirit of rebellion, of hate, of envy, jealousy, evil surmising, judgmentalism, discord, selfishness, exploitation, a willingness to abuse others, to inflict punishments upon others, to make them pay for their sin crimes. We get the exact opposite. Remember the people putting Jesus on the cross, driving this, they were doing it because Jesus broke their religious laws because he was a blasphemer, because he didn't obey their religious rules, because they, he didn't accept God as they presented him. This was not mur uh, putting a, a, a murderer and criminal on the, on the cross. They were doing this because they had a view of God that caused them to believe that justice was punishing the sinner for their sin. That's why they were doing this. We get the exact opposite of the fruits of those of the Holy Spirit. We get the fruits of the demonic spirits and we end up warring against God while we claim to be leaders of his church, like those Jewish leaders who crucified Christ. Could one sin have been found in Christ? Had he been in one particular, had he in one particular yielded to Satan to escape the terrible torture, the enemy of God and man would have triumphed. Christ bowed his head and died. 
but he held fast his faith and his submission to the Father. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ and the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was lay, laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could, not, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts and before them accused Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of, of blackness and the defilement of sin. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. The Adventist reformers here identify Satan as the murderer of Jesus, the legalists that took control of the Adventist church identify God as the executioner of Jesus. But they say that God killed him to satisfy his justice, just like the Jews were killing Jesus to satisfy their justice. These are not reconcilable, folks, these two views. You have to choose. Which view is it? Is Satan the author of death, the murderer from the beginning? Is Satan the one that exposed himself as murdering the Son of God? Or do we worship God and claim he was the one who killed Jesus at the cross to pay our sin penalties? They are opposites, these two views, diametrically opposed because they are rooted in two antagonistic systems, two divergent laws. God's design law of love versus Satan's imposed law system. This paragraph by the, one of the Adventist reformers describes Jesus in, you know, describes Jesus and how he is uplifted. He draws all into him. Jesus, you know, said those things. When I am lifted up, I will draw all into me. And uh, the and now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And and there's a revelation quote about how the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Similar idea there. If you read the quote about I will draw all into me. The, the Bible translations will often say all men, but men is supplied. It's actually not in the original. Jesus was saying he would draw all into him. The angels are being drawn, as it says, drawn and says in Colossians. And, and they are no longer able to harass. Satan's angels are no longer able to harass the heavenly angels. Why? Not because there's a force shield holding them back, but because the heavenly angels, as a revelation of truth, recognizing God's design law principles, recognizing that Satan is the source of death, uh, the, the liar and fraud from the beginning, their minds are sealed. No longer will any of Satan's lies have any power over them. And that's what our minds are to be. Our minds are to be sealed into the truth so that these in, imperial Roman legal lies will never have power over us again and we'll see God in his true light. Continue with the quote, and it gets better. She actually expounds even better on these things. Yet Satan was not then destroyed. The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. And for the sake of man, that you're my sake and my sake, Satan's existence must be continued. Man, as well as the angels, must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. He must choose he will, whom he will serve. What was left to be revealed? What did man not yet understand or know that could only be understood by evidence, by the outworking of the principles in reality? I want you to notice the very next words from this author, what comes next, and it is exactly where we find ourselves today and the battle that's going on today. What is it that needs to be revealed? The two distinct elements that need it, it's what view one holds over law, what the 1880s um, um, message of the reformers was trying to bring and how that message has been suppressed. Notice what she says next had to be revealed. In the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed, that justice was inconsistent with mercy, and that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Every sin must meet its punishment urged Satan. And if God should remit the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice. 
When men broke the law of God and defied his will, Satan exalted. It was proved, he declared, that the law could not be obeyed. Man could not be forgiven. Because he, after his rebellion, had been banished from heaven, Satan claimed that the human race must forever be shut out from God, God's favor. God could not be just. He, Satan, urged, and yet show mercy to the sinner. The principles to be more fully revealed after the cross were that human imposed law constructs do not heal hearts and minds, that legal penalties paid to a punishing deity do not restore love and trust, but instead perpetuate rebellion and sin. And that's exactly what we see in the dark ages and through the history of Christianity when they rejected what Jesus revealed and accepted the Roman idea of law and began in teaching an imperial dictator God who requires that intercession be done, blood be offered, and all types of ritualist and legalistic things be done. And they teach that God will use his power to put down sin. The lie that God's law functions like human law and thus justice is punishing the wicked. This is the lie that had to be shown by evidence does not restore love and trust and does not free sinners from sin. And this is how things will, will be in the end with Satan impersonating Christ and claiming that his justice requires that unrepented sins must be punished. And therefore those who refuse to accept him as their sin bearer who has taken their punishment upon himself, he will be required to sadly punish. And when he comes to impersonate Christ, this will be his argument. And billions will say, this is our God, we have waited for him. Continuing on with the quote. But even as a sinner, man was in a different position from that of Satan. Lucifer in heaven had sinned in the light of God's glory. To him, as to no other created being, was given a revelation of God's love. Understanding the character of God, knowing his goodness, Satan chose to follow his own selfish, independent will. This choice was final. There was no more God could do to save him. But man was deceived. His mind was darkened by Satan's sophistry. The height and depth of the love of God, he did not know. For him, there is hope in a legal payment made to a ruling authority. No, no. for him, there is hope in a knowledge of God's love. Amen. By beholding his character, he might be drawn back to God. Amen. Our hope is in the truth of God, his character of love, his design law methods, how he governs and rules his universe in truth, love, and freedom. Then we can have the lies purged from our hearts and be won back to trust. And when we open the heart in trust, we receive from the Holy Spirit uh, a new heart and a right spirit. He pours his love into our hearts. We receive the life of Christ reproduced in us. We are reborn, recreated, renewed, re cleansed. Okay. This is not a legal adjustment. It is healing, recreation, renewal. It is reality. Through the design, through the design law of worship, by beholding, we become changed. We become like Jesus, indwelled by the spirit and transformed by his presence. Continuing on with the quote, through Jesus, God's mercy was manifest, but mercy does not set aside justice. The law reveals the attitude, excuse me, the attributes of God's character and not a jot or tittle of it could be changed to meet man in his fallen condition. God did not change his law but he sacrificed himself in Christ for man's redemption. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Why could the law not be changed to meet man in his fallen condition? For the same reason the law of respiration cannot be changed to meet a person who ties a plastic bag over their head or are drowning underwater. The person must be changed. They must be put back in harmony with the law for God's laws are the laws upon which life are built to operate, and thus Jesus sacrificed himself to eliminate the infection, the breach to the to love, to eliminate fear and selfishness and restore humanity back into harmony with God and his living law. And then what is justice? Justice is doing what's right or what's just. According to what? The law. The law defines what's right and just. Well, what law? If one believes the human law lie, then they claim that justice is inflicting the proper punishment and killing the, the lawbreaker. But since the Adventist reformers were advancing the sign law and reality of God as creator, notice what this Adventist reformer writes in the very next paragraph after she just got done saying that mercy did not set aside justice and the law 
reveals the attributes about God, now she will actually state affirmatively what the law requires, which is justice. Notice this. The law requires righteousness, a righteous life, a perfect character. Notice this author does not say the law requires a just penalty, a death penalty, a blood payment. It doesn't say that because that's human law. That's inflicting punishment. But when you understand the laws of health and you understand that sin takes you out of harmony with life, the just and right thing is to remove the, the death causing principle, the sickness, and restore one to rightness with God or righteousness to restore one to life. So the law requires righteousness, a righteous life, a perfect character. This man has not to give. He cannot meet the claims of God's holy law. What does God's holy law claim? That we live in harmony with it, that we're righteous. But Christ coming to earth as a man lived a holy life and notice developed a perfect character. That's a human character. He already had a perfect divine character, developed a perfect human character. These he offers as a free gift to God to pay for our sins? No, he offers to all who will accept, who will receive them. His life stands for the life of men. Thus they have remission of sins that are passed through what? A blood payment to God? No, through the forbearance of God. More than this, Christ imbues men with the attributes of God. He builds up the human character after the similitude of the divine character, a goodly fabric of spiritual strength and beauty. Thus, the very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer in Christ. God can be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus, Romans 3.26. Notice what justice is. She didn't say or write that the broken law requires a death penalty be paid to the government, to God or God's law in order to maintain justice. She wrote that the law requires righteousness, which is rightness. And that is what justice is, which is the restoration of rightness into the human being for God's law is the basis of life. This requires the human being to develop a perfect character. And this is what Jesus came to do because we couldn't do it. And having developed a perfect character, then righteousness, then righteousness, which is God's justice, or doing what is right, is the application of what Jesus achieved to us, to imbue us, to build us up after the similitude of the divine, with the attributes of God, with Christ's likeness. We have forgiveness of our sins, not through a legal payment, as they legalists, the legal liars in our church would claim but we have forgiveness of God through the forbearance of God. And the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer, not in the legal book in some registry in heaven where we're declared to be legally righteous even though we're not. We become the righteousness of God as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is how God is just, but he's also the justifier or the restoring of us to be just or right with God by healing us from sin. This is the message the Adventist reformers brought to the church in 1888 and is the message that was rejected by the legalistic leadership who continue to hold power in the administration of our organization and continue to publish the legal lies in our documents. Continuing on. God's love has been expressed in his justice no less than his mercy. Justice is the foundation of his throne and the fruit of his love. It has been Satan's purpose to divorce mercy from truth and justice. He sought to prove that the righteousness of God's law is an enemy to peace. But Christ shows that God's, in God's plan, they are indissolubly linked. The one cannot exist without the other. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteous and peace have kissed each other. How? by showing that God's law is design law, the living law of life, and by restoring that law into humanity, God does what is right or just by eliminating the death-causing principle sinfulness and restoring us to righteousness. That's the right and just thing to do, and that's the love and merciful thing to do. By his life and death, Christ proved that God's justice did not destroy mercy, but that sin could be forgiven and that the law is righteous and can be perfectly obeyed. Satan's charges were refuted. God had given man unmistakable evidence of his love. Jesus as a human, using only human abilities, 
chose to love perfectly and to voluntarily surrender his life in love. Thus, in his humanity, Jesus destroyed the infection of fear and selfishness, the carnal nature, the me first principle that Satan sowed into humanity and rose again in a purified humanity with a perfect sinless character that he developed. It says in Hebrews 5, 9, once he was made perfect, he became the source of salvation for all who obey him. And Bible perfection is not sinlessness. Adam and Eve were sinless. Lucifer was sinless at one point, but they weren't perfected. Perfection is settling into the truth with a mature character so that he cannot be moved. Jesus was always sinless, but he had to develop a mature or perfected character, which he did. And we receive this as a free gift via the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We get new desires, new motives, new insights, new inspiration. And as we choose to say yes to this leading of the Holy Spirit, we are transformed and grow more like Christ. Continuing on. <laughs> Another deception was now to be brought forward. Satan declared that mercy destroyed justice and that the death of Christ abrogated the Father's law. Had it been possible for the law to be changed or abrogated, then Christ need not have died. But to abrogate the law would be to immortalize transgression and place the world under Satan's control. It was because the law was changeless because man could be saved only through obedience to its precepts that Jesus was lifted up on the cross. Yet the very means by which Christ established the law, Satan represents as destroying it. Here will come the last conflict of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And this is the replacement of design law, God's law. You can't change the laws of respiration and have people live. You can't change the laws of health. God's laws are the very basis upon which the fabric of the cosmos and reality itself function, including the moral laws. To try and change them destroys it, not one jot or tittle of the uh, law will change. And thus, this last controversy is when it is taught that God's laws are not design laws. They're simply made up rules that function like Rome uh, and they're amendable. And people can argue over which law or that law, but that's not the point. When they're arguing over which law, this law or that law, they've already accepted the lie that God's law is changeable. Continuing on. That the law which was spoken by God's own voice is faulty, that some specification has been set aside is the claim which Satan now puts forward. It is the last great deception that he will bring upon the world. He needs not assail the whole law. If he can lead men to disregard one precept, his purpose is gained. For whoever shall keep the a whole law yet offend in one point is guilty of all. By consenting to break one precept, men are brought under Satan's power. By substituting human law for God's law, Satan will seek to control the world, like the human imperial law construct that requires inflicted punishment. The world is foretold, is foretold in prophecy of the great apostate power, which is the representative of Satan. It is declared he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand. Again, it doesn't matter which point because if you, you will only change a point of the law if you believe the law is changeable. The Roman church in the dark ages never passed a law that the people who take Eucharist would have gravity reduced by two thirds so they could build those grand cathedrals with much great, greater ease. They never pass a law that on bad pollution days, you, you, the members of their church don't have to breathe because they know they can't change design laws. If they make laws to change any of God's laws, attempting to, it's only a revelation that they have accepted the lie that God's law functions like human law, amendable and changeable. And the Adventist church, while rejecting some of the so-called alleged changes, have never rejected the true change that God's law is post. The 1888 reformers tried to when they said that the Ten Commandments were added, but the legalists rejected that and clung to Roman and said, oh no, those rules that were given later, they are God's eternal law, which means our church functions like Rome, our God functions like Rome. He made up rules and puts them on us. Men will surely set up their laws to counterwork the laws of God. They will seek to compel the consciences of others and in their zeal to enforce these laws, they will oppress their fellow man. Did we not see this during COVID? Yes. Men setting up laws to coerce the consciences of their fellow men and oppress their fellow men. And did we not see the church leadership of our own church join hands with the state and in all of our institutions, church, hospitals, clinics, and schools, they coerce the consciences of their members. Why did they do it? 
because they rejected the message of 1888 and accepted that God's law functions like human law. And so it only seemed right and just for them to do it for a good cause. We must do this to save lives. The warfare against God's law, which was begun in heaven, will be continued until the end of time. Every man will be tested. Obedience or disobedience is the question to be decided by the whole world. All will be called to choose between the law of God and the laws of men. Here, the dividing line will be drawn. There will be but two classes. Every character will be fully developed, and all will show whether they have chosen the side of loyalty or that of rebellion. The Adventist reformers taught that the warfare against God's law began in heaven. Notice that what it says, began in heaven. And when it began, there was no seventh day Sabbath. There were no 10 commandments in existence yet. All of that stuff was added. And even the Sabbath itself was made for man, not for angels. Angels didn't have the written law to not commit adultery or sins would pass down three and four generations or honor their mothers and fathers. So how did Satan begin his warfare against God in heaven? By alleging what was written in this chapter, that every sin must meet its punishment, urged Satan, that God makes up rules and punishes rule breakers. He changed the way they conceived of God's law, that he is nothing different than a creature making up rules and using power to coerce them, which destroys love and incites fear. And we develop our characters based on the God we worship and by beholding we are changed and the God we worship, hear this now, the God we worship is determined by what we believe about his law. If you believe his law functions like human law, then you worship an imperial dictator, a creature who has to use power to inflict punishments on others. If you believe his laws are design laws, then you're worshiping the creator and you recognize that deviation from design laws, as the Bible says, wages of sin is death. Sin when full grown brings forth death. Those who sow to the carnal nature from that nature reap destruction and the creator uses power to heal and save. He doesn't use power to coerce and torture. Continuing on, then the end will come. God will vindicate his law and deliver his people. Satan and all who have joined him in the rebellion will be cut off. Sin and uh, sinners will perish, root and branch. Satan the root and the followers the branches. The word will be fulfilled to the prince of evil because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thou shalt be as terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Then the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. They shall be as though they had not been. What does this mean? Does this mean all that I've said so far in this chapter and all that this author has written ultimately comes down to God will use his power to destroy? That he is an inflictor, he is the one who uses power to, to crush his enemies? No, not at all. The author explains in unequivocal, clear language, in her words, in the very next chapter, uh, par excuse me, paragraph, notice what the very next words that come about the idea, I will destroy thee, O covering chair. Notice, this is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. He's not using power to inflict it. The rejectors of his mercy reap that which they have sown. As it says in Galatians, those who sow to the carnal nature from that nature, not from God, reap destruction. This author says, the rejectors of his mercy reap that which they have sown. God is the fountain of life. Design law, life comes from God, not death. And when one chooses the service of sin, he, the sinner, separates from God and thus cuts himself off from life. He is alienated from the life of God. Christ says, all they that hate me love death. God gives them existence for a time that they may develop their character and reveal their principles. This accomplished, they receive the result of their own choices. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him place themselves out of harmony with God so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. Yet we who are righteous live for it. There's nothing harmful in the fire. 
At the beginning of the great controversy, the angels did not understand this. Had Satan and his host been left to reap the full results of their sin, they would have perished. But it would have not been apparent to the heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. A doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds and as evil seed to produce its deadly fruit of sin and woe. But not so when the great controversy shall be ended. Then the plan of redemption, having been completed, the character of God is revealed to all his all created intelligences. The precepts of his law are seen to be perfect and mutable, design laws, protocols upon which reality exists. Then sin, sin has made manifest its nature, Satan, his character. Then the extermination of sin will vindicate God's love and establish his honor before the universe of beings who delight to do his will and whose heart is his law. God sets things on an eternal basis of security so that sin never rises again by eliminating fear, by eliminating lies, by winning us to trust, by a revelation of truth. This is all design law stuff, folks. And this imperial penal legal fraud infecting our church is an obstruction to the final message of mercy that is to go to the world that will seal and settle hearts in loyalty to God and prepare us to take an eternal message to the world. And I'll pause there now and, and take questions. That was the entire chapter, folks. And do you see how it stands in stark contrast to the yeah. things that have, are being taught mm -hmm. about God being required to kill his son on the cross? And if he didn't kill him, he would kill us. This stuff is absolutely corrupt. It comes from the pits of hell. It is Satan's lie from the beginning. And it is exactly the opposite of what our church is supposed to be teaching. So let's jump into Wednesday then. <laughs> it, I mean, that was big. Do you see how powerful that chapter is? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> and, and my notes, uh, my notes include my comments. So if you want my comments and, and elucidation on that chapter, then go after Dean posts the notes and download the notes. You'll have the chapter and paragraph by paragraph commentary and breakdown an application on what those things mean. If you'd like to have those. Uh, first paragraph says, one graphic depiction of Christ's ultimate victory is found in the pre-advent scene in Daniel 7, which shows that after judgment is given in favor of the saints of the Most High, Daniel 7, 22, New King James Version, his kingdom is established and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Because of the cross, the promise of the kingdom is assured. And this sentence... Christ's ultimate victory is found in the pre-advent judgment, uh, we haven't seen of Daniel 7, which shows that after judgment is given, quote, in favor of the saints of the Most High. Well, this is interesting. So let's read the quote out of Daniel 7, 21 and 22 from the New King James Version. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the most high and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom if you notice the word words in favor i don't know if it came through in that in that um powerpoint but if you read it in the original the words in favor are italicized in the new king james uh, version which indicates they are not in the Hebrew, that they're added by the translators. Thought it might be interesting to read in the King James Version, see, see if there's a difference. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came for them to, um, to possess the, the kingdom. The law lens makes a difference in how we translate this. In the human law lie version, judgment is a judicial act by the ruling magistrate to determine guilt or innocence or whether proper legal compensation and payment has been made to the judicial system uh, so that the, the, uh, the ruling authority doesn't have to use this power to uh, hurt the sin criminals. Uh, in the, in, that's the legal view. And so the legal problem is our sin crimes which require punishment. And so we need judgment pronounced in our favor. In the design law view, though, the problem is that we have believed lies about God and broke trust with him, and that the only way to restore us to trust is to remove the lies about God, and God's enemy, uh, and God's enemy symbolized by the little horn powers warring against the saints, and, he's, and the little horn powers winning the war 
until judgment, according to the King James, is given to, to the saints. In other words, the saints are given judgment, given discernment, given the ability to differentiate the truth and the lies, which means until the truth about God's character and design laws is recovered from the lies of Romanism, which has been infecting the minds of Christianity and keeping them from judging God in his right light. And a time comes in human history where we are to reveal God's character, give him glory, because the hour has come for him to be judged. The hour of his judgment has come. And this is what... Um, you know, Paul indicates in several places, one, that we live, that we live in the world, we don't wage wars, the world does, the weapons we fight with are not worldly, on the contrary, they have divine power, and notice, this is the idea, the little horn power is waging war, Paul says we don't wage wars, the world does, so this is the same warfare, and Paul says uh, our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and take captive every thought. So Paul is elucidating the type of warfare the little horn power is waging, and he's waging a war for hearts and minds and he's doing it by misrepresenting God, seeking to change times and laws by getting us to believe God's law works like human law. And Paul says in Romans 3, 4, that God be proven true and every human be shown a liar just as it is written so that you, speaking of God, may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Understanding the whole great controversy the orb began in heaven, Satan lied about God in heaven. He lied about God in Eden. He's been lying about God through all human history. God is the one who's been lied about, and God has been the one who's been revealing truth so that the truth will set us free from those lies and we'll be restored to trust. Thus, the ultimate war is the little horn power is winning the war against the saints until judgment is given to us, until judgment, until discernment is given to us that we can say, no, God is not like that. God is like Jesus has revealed him to be. This is the ultimate judgment, and it's not penal, legal, or judicial. Uh, and when we present this judgment scene in heaven as being a penal, legal, judicial thing where God is making judicial rulings, we're actually continuing the warfare and advancing the little horn's lies. It's quite corrupt and disgusting. Any questions about that? I'm sure that I said something people have questions about. I'm, I mean, it, <laughs> <coughs> Tim? Yeah. So uh, in that last verse, the you, the Y-O-U, uh, to them, that's us. We're going to be judging God. Is that what you were saying? So, so that you will be justified in your words and be prevailed when you are judged. So that's talking about God. So that God will be justified in his words and will prevail when he is judged. Okay, good. U is capitalized. Oh, I didn't realize that. Sometimes in some versions, depending on which version, they will capitalize the U in that text to make it. The other versions don't. The New English didn't capitalize it, but other versions do. But that's who Paul is referring to. That God, God may you be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Understand the whole controversy and just think about this very simply. If somebody came to you and told you lie, or somebody, excuse me, if you discovered that someone had lied to your spouse about you, and your spouse believed lies about you and believed you've been cheating, but you haven't been cheating, and you love your spouse, and you want to have your spouse reconciled back into love and trust with you, even though you've done no wrong, who's the one being examined and who's being judged? Yes. You are. You're the one who's on trial. You're the one who has to present the evidence. You're the one who proves your innocence because your spouse is a victim of a liar and believing lies about you. And that's the whole great controversy. Satan is a liar about God, and he has multiple different types of lies about God. Perhaps the most pernicious lies about God are those told by those who claim to believe in God. You know, the idea of an eternal burning hell is a pernicious lie about God. But so is the idea that God's law functions like human law and that God is the source of death that he inflicts upon people's punishment for sin. And it's so sad that these religious leaders use the human law systems and teach that God does. They crucified Christ because they judged him to be uh, breaking their religious laws. And they teach that God will do the very same thing that they did to Christ in the end for those who won't obey the religious laws. It's very sad. Why is it so important to some people to hold on to that when there's when it's when you're able to take the data scripture science our you know the holy spirit's influence in our lives 
is so strong on the idea that God is the God that you're describing, why would people still hang on to? Um, I think there's a variety of reasons. I think for some, the Pharisees in Christ's day, Ellen White gives a, a little hints of this, that they, they had glimpses of truth and they were convinced they were wrong, but ego and pride would not let them. I know of people who hold to this other view or have held of it. Some of them have passed along now and no longer with us. Um, but, but they never never came around to accept what we teach. And some of the ones I know of have spent years of their life uh, writing doctrinal thesis on penal substitution theology, um, writing books on penal substitution theology, um, making sermons and lectures on penal substitution theology. And so one potential reason is ego and pride will not let them acknowledge that their life work of 20 years of writing some dissertation and some systematic theology on penal substitution theology, if we're right, their whole system of theology is wrong and ego won't let them be wrong. They've worked too hard to be wrong. And That's yet, some people. And yet we have teachers who have come to look at God in this light, who have regretted, who've had horrible regret over the 40 years that they taught another picture. And, and they Yes, have some people are like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They're able to come and recognize and make a change of heart. Others are like uh, Caiaphas uh, and, uh, and double down on their position. Others are like Saul of Tarsus, who, who had the penal legal view and used the penal legal methods of coercion and force to punish those who were worshiping God different than him, and then had his Damascus Road experience and had a complete transformation and began practicing the principles of every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. We present the truth and love and we leave people free. So yes, some will do it and some won't, but ego and pride may be a big part of it. Tim, I, I see a, a parallel in the uh, codependent uh, relationship that uh, is described in psychology where a person who um, loves so much their family or their friend or whatever that they're willing to allow them to take advantage of them, they're willing to allow them to um, present a false picture of being uh, so this is an interesting thing you're saying, Ken, um, because I think there's some people then, some see are arrogant and pride, and I think you're right. Some people, it's um, an affection for others. Yeah. Their affection for others is so great that they don't want to be alienated in those relationships. So they continue to go along with this teaching in order to keep harmony in the family or to keep yeah. peace or, or even uh, if my grandmother believed it and she was such a sweet grandma to me and she believed it this way, who might have questioned what my, so trusting what somebody else has taught, not really thinking it through for themselves or based on affection. I think a lot of those things are true as well. So thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, a, it's the idea that you're, you love somebody so much that you're willing to excuse their faults and, and somehow allow Satan with his accusations to take away the, the, the dependence upon God that we really have to have, you know, to, yeah. to gain victory. And, and, and then one other reason I think people like the penal legal model, it allows them to actually continue in their whatever their personal preference of sin is, whether they're a mafioso boss running a mafia and they can go to confession and uh, confess the, the murders and hits they've ordered this week and have absolution for those sins and still believe that they're, in, they're gonna have eternal salvation, or whether it's a, a, uh, a Protestant Christian who simply continues in their porn, secret porn addiction or whatever, or their arrogance and prides and judgmentalism and gossiping of others, and they simply go, and Jesus, I sinned again today, I claim your blood over my sins, or, uh, and please erase them from the books and they can continue to live their reprobate life while they claim legal pardon because they are declared to be righteous even though they remain unrighteous. It gives them the, this, this, uh, this false system of legal security while they can continue to live an unrighteous life. I think that, there'll be some in that camp as well. Let's go ahead and close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are the God of reality, not the God of fantasy and that you have created all reality to operate in harmony with your perfect character of love. And that you sent Jesus to take humanity broken and damaged by sin and restore it to perfect harmony with you. And through Jesus, we, through our trust and faith in him, can receive his victory into our hearts and be restored to harmony with you, to have new hearts and right spirits and be transformed and to be settled and sealed by the inworking of the Holy Spirit that nothing can shake us 
out of our love and friendship and loyalty to you. And we pray for that now that we can be more effective at this time in his human history to call people out of this corrupt, fallen, Babylonian, imperial, legalistic system that traps people in fear and bring them out into the freedom of your true kingdom. We pray in your holy name. Amen. 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 All right, we'll take a short break and do our Q&A.